All right, so it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Guido for this course on uh, probabilistic modeling and uh, Bayesian inference. Um, Guido, it's up to you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Matteo. It's a, it's a great pleasure to uh, be able to teach uh, in this uh, Spring College. And uh, um, I'll start sharing the screen. So I think the format, uh, if you have questions, do put them in the chat. Uh, I know it's a little bit difficult sometimes because when I'm sharing the screen, I may not see whether there is something in the chat, but as Matteo was suggesting, I'll, every 10 minutes I'll take a, a mini break and enable questions in the chat. So that, that would be uh, hopefully a good way to keep it interactive as much as it can be possible. That of course is not as interactive as if you were here in person. So I'll share my screen, I'll share a whiteboard um, page and minimize Matteo so that he doesn't cover up most of my whiteboard. Excellent, so probabilistic modeling and Bayesian inference. So what is this all about? Well, this is a spring college in complex systems, and you probably are um, very well aware that uh, most complex systems are not uh, fully reproducible, so they exhibit some stochasticity. Now, uh, what do we intend by stochasticity? Stochasticity. What I mean by this is that if we uh, repeat the same experiment, let's say, you get a different result in general. Not deterministic in nature. And uh, um, this might be because of a variety of reasons. It might be because there is extreme sensitivity to initial conditions, like you're in a chaotic, different, in a chaotic dynamical system, or it can be because um, there is intrinsic uh, stochasticity, say in quantum mechanics, but also in uh, systems, for example, of uh, chemical kinetics in uh, um, very low molecule numbers. Obviously, the strategy, if you don't get the same result every time you do the same experiment, is to try to model the variability instead of modeling the directly only the outcome. And what we'll be doing is to formulate all our models in terms of probability distributions. Now, I kind of assume that you have been exposed to a little bit of the foundations of probability, of probability calculus. Now, there are very different levels of uh, mathematical rigor you can teach these from. I'll take a, a somewhat practical but reasonably rigorous uh, level. And when we talk about probabilistic, probabilistic modeling, what we mean is that we're going to consider the outcomes of the experiments. Let's say uh, the variable that we eventually measure is going to be a random variable. And we're going to model its probability distribution. Okay, so the probability distribution is essentially what gives us a weight for each possible outcome. So probability distributions have to be greater than zero for all possible outcomes. And this outcome, this index here might be even, you know, um, non-numerable index set if we're thinking about uh, continuous random variables. And we must have that the sum of the probability associated to each event over all possible events must be equal to one. 
So it defines a measure over the set of possible values taken by the random variable x. Okay, so this could be written. Okay, so let me write it just to give you an idea of the type of uh, notational shortcuts that we will employ, that I will employ regularly. This would be written really as this. So the probability that the random variable x takes the value xi, this must be always greater or equal to zero. It's possible to have events that never happen. And then I will systematically shorten this p of x equal xi into p of xi, okay? The thing that we will be primarily interested in is the situation where we have more than one random variable. Yeah? And the simplest case is when we have two. So we have a random variable uh, x and a random variable y, and we will define a joint probability distribution over the pairs of random variable x and y. And by this, I mean the probability let's say p of xi, yi, that x is equal to xi and y is equal to yi. This is the joint probability. Sorry, sometimes I have difficulties with my pen. So that's why I suddenly stop. Now, another question that we may ask when we have more than one random variable is uh, the relevance of one random variable with respect to the other really. And so we may want to ask, what is the probability oh, come on, ben. What is the probability of Xi given Yi? So if I know that y has taken a particular value, how does this affect my belief over the variable x? So this is called the conditional probability. And the final ingredient in the basic things we need to know about probabilities is what is the probability of x taking the value xi regardless of what y is. Ah, pen. This is called the marginal probability. And the, the reason why it's called the marginal probability is very neat because In the old days, a lot of these probabilities were just simply tables where you would have the values of the two variables and you would have, uh, you know, say here are the possible values of X, here are the possible values of Y. And when we, on, on the last column, on the margins of the table, you would have P of Y. So here would be the value of Y equals one, let's say first value regardless of the three values that x take. So it's called the marginal probability because it was written at the margins and was given by summing the rows or the columns of the um, <clears throat> table. So the final fundamental ingredient is the celebrated base here. Now Bayes, the Reverend Bayes was a student at my other institution. So I'm a professor at CISA, but I'm also a professor at the University of Edinburgh where Bayes studied theology many, many years ago, about uh, 300 years ago, almost. And he observed that uh, a trivial consequence of the fundamental laws of probability allows you to say something really non-trivial. So the first law of probability 
we've already seen, and it's this marginaliz it's the normalization property. Yeah? But the second law is a relationship between uh, the um, marginal and the joint. So the probability of Xi is equal to the sum over all possible values of yj of p of xi yj. That's the marginalization property. And the third fundamental property is that the probability of xi joint with yi is equal to the probability of xi given yi times the probability of yi. Okay, so if I want to know what is the probability of observing simultaneously xi and yi, well, I can think first, let's observe y and see yi. What is the probability of this yi? And then given that I've observed yi, what is the probability of xi? Now, obviously, this is purely symmetrical. It doesn't matter whether I choose to observe yi before xi. And so we get also that this is p of yi given xi times p of xi. And therefore, Bayes' theorem simply takes this observation of this equality and tells us that the probability of observing yi given xi is, well, it's the probability of xi, of xi given yi times the probability of yi divided by the probability of xi. So this is Bayes' theorem. So um, let's take uh, the first mini break. So I've done a very, very quick uh, run through what I mean by uh, stochastic modeling, by random variables. The basic concept when you talk about random variable is that you shift from modeling the precise value of the variable and how it depends on other variables to model the distribution of the possible values of the variable of interest and how it connects to other random variables of interest. And then we've listed the basic properties of probabilities, including Bayes theorem. So are there any uh, questions that uh, people want to pose in the chat? Aha, uh -huh, yes. Can I please explain marginal probability again? So, uh, sure. So marginal probability is the probability of observing xi regardless of what yi is. And that is obtained as I have a joint probability law. So I have a probability distribution of the joint values of the x random variable and the y random variable. And what I need to do is to um, sum out over all possible values of y And let, let's call it yj actually instead of yi. So I don't want you to be confused. It, you, it's not the case that x must have the same number of possible outcomes than y. So it could be, this could be that, I don't know, x could take three values and y could take uh, seven values or something like that. Or in general, they could both be continuous variables and one, or one of them could be a continuous variable and the other is a discrete variable and so on. 
So this is the definition of the marginal probability. Probability of x taking a certain value regardless of the values of y. And you obtain that by considering the probability of x being that value and y, all the possible values of y, and summing that. Is this uh, clear now? Professor? Yes. Uh, what is the difference between uh, marginal probability? If I calculate the probability of xi individually, yes. And yes. what's the difference between these two uh, quantities? No, so the marginal probability is the probability of, so we're always thinking about the scenario where we have two random variables, yeah? I don't know, uh, yeah. say Ooh. temperature and pressure, for example, yeah? Yeah. And the two things are linked. Oh, okay. So you want to know what is the probability of a certain temperature regardless, regardless of, the... of what the pressure is. Pressure is, yeah. And but so they're interrelated. What... Exactly. So what you need to do is to say, okay, you have some probability distribution over the pressures because, you know, that is your system, for example, and um, you uh, sum the probability of the temperature being that value that you're interested in yeah. and the pressure being a certain value yeah. across all possible values of pressure. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. I have another, I have another question. I have a question. Yes, please ask. Uh, this Bayes uh, theorem, how the how is it different with frequency frequency theorem in probability? With frequentist probability. Yes, mean. yes. Yes. Okay. So that was going to be what we were going to talk about after the question session. So maybe it's a good time to move. Okay. Yeah, so there are two broad schools of probability yeah? of, of statistics, really. Yeah? So there is frequentist and frequentist versus Bayesian. So this dichotomy is really about what is your interpretation of probability, okay? So if we're thinking in terms of measure theorem and, and so on, you know, the way I've introduced the concepts of probability are really, the probability gives me a measure over a set of possible events. And these rules have nothing to do with being Bayesian or being frequentist. Now, the question that you are posing, I think, is uh, you can't read what I'm writing. Uh, is that true of everyone? Well, oh, I mean, you can't read because I, I write in, a, in an incomprehensible way. I see. Okay, that's, that's a more serious problem. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, I think the next times I'll go on a blackboard at ICTP. So frequentist versus Bayesian. And uh, um, so what I've written, uh, it doesn't really matter. This is just the title of the section. What I've written is uh, so far, I've just looked at basically uh, rules of probability, yeah? defined as a measure of a set of possible events, marginalization, product rule, Bayes theorem, they are all obvious true statements. Now the difference between frequentist and Bayesian is what is our interpretation of what probability means, okay? So in the frequentist scenario, so for frequentists, this is not something that I was particularly going to get into for frequentist statisticians the probability of x taking a certain value xi is defined 
is defined as a limit in the number of infinite number of experiments of the number of times x is equal to xi over the number of experiments. Okay, number of experiments goes to infinity. So in this way, you are supposed to have observed the world a lot of times, and then you can define what the probability of a certain event is as an approximation of the limit. However, there are many scenarios where we are interested in situations where this limiting approach is, is not even conceptually possible. Yeah? And, and for example, you know, if I wanted to ask a question, uh, you know, suppose Italy is going to play football against England next month. What is the probability that Italy will win? Now that's a question that is well defined and very often asked in the common life, but it doesn't make any sense in the frequency statistician world because it's impossible for Italy to have played against England an infinite amount of number of times. And of course, even if it has played a large number of times, it will have been different teams on different conditions in different days. So for Bayesian statisticians, the probability of x taking a value xi is defined in a somewhat hazy way as the degree of belief in outcome. x equals to xi. So from the Bayesian perspective, you're supposed to think that there is um, an expert or someone that knows something about your, the system you're interested in that uh, will uh, be able to quantify these probabilities and then you can operate on them. How would you operate on them? Well, let's see. We have seen that Bayes' theorem tells us that uh, the probability of y taking a certain value, given that we've observed x taking a certain value, is given by uh, the probability of x given y times p of yi divided by p of xi. So how do we interpret these terms? Okay, so the expert has a prior belief about what y should be. And also the expert has a belief about what x should be given that y is something. So the prior has a model of the, how the, the, the expert has a model of how x is connected with y. This is called the likelihood And if I can get the pen to write, the likelihood, the likelihood model. So if I have a prior belief and I have a likelihood model, then Bayes' theorem tells me how to update my belief. And this is called, in fact, the posterior belief. <clears throat> 
posterior because it comes post having observed your uh, outcome, which in this case is an experiment on X. Good, good, good. Okay, so some people can understand the writing. That's, cheers me. Okay, so this is the kind of the basics of probabilistic modeling and Bayesian inference. So probabilistic modeling means setting up models in terms of relationships between random variables. So to do probabilistic modeling, you have to start with some beliefs about at least some of the variables, priors, and you have to start with some model that tells you how likely some observations would be starting from your prior belief. So you need the prior and the likelihood. This is a probabilistic model. It's a model of the probabilistic relationships between different random variables. And Bayesian inference is a procedure that allows you to connect the prior beliefs and the likelihood model in order to update your belief on the unobserved variables. So a simple example, and we'll see actually explicitly how this works. Suppose you had um, uh, you know, a variable let's say your variable X and you have a very broad belief about this variable. And then you observe uh, a variable Y, okay, which is equal to is equal to X plus a little bit of noise, okay? So if X is equal to three, then your Y would be centered, would be distributed like this. Yeah? Let's say this is three. So it would be something that can fall around there. So now suppose I observe Y equal, let's say um, one, two, three, so on. Suppose now observe y equals, I don't know, five. So I have an observation here. Well, then after having observed that, my belief over x will no longer be spread all over the number, the real numbers, but it will be much more concentrated. It will be something like this. So this would be the prior. This would be the likelihood. So this is y given x equals three. And this would be the posterior. Okay. Uh, any questions? Let's have a, a, wee a wee pause. So, you know, the important thing that I've been telling you now in these last 10 minutes or so is really the key concept of the course, okay? To do probabilistic modeling, you have to formulate all your models in terms of random variables. And you have to formulate the model in terms of probabilistic relationships between random variables. And Bayesian inference is important because it is the procedure that allows you to update your belief on unobserved variables based on observations. And that's why it's so uh, important and used in practice. Uh, now, how do I get the chat? So I see that there is some question. Why don't you unmute yourself and ask questions now? Uh, 
<clears throat> Sir, I have a question. Yes. So no probabilistic modeling is possible without some prior belief? Yeah, that is a good question, indeed. So it's, let's say it is possible to formulate likelihood models, yeah? But if you want to do Bayesian inference, then you have to compute, combine the likelihood model with the prior. So you could have, say, absolute certainty that your unobserved variable y is equal to, I don't know, five, say, and you could still have a stochastic outcome x. But then y would not be a random variable. Okay? So you would only have one random variable. If you have multiple random variables, then you have to have something that acts like a prior and something that acts like a likelihood in order to build the model. Is this uh, sufficiently clear? Uh, I think so. Oh, thank you. Professor. Yes, uh, please. Uh, in the de denominator, you wrote P of X, I. Is that the marginal probability? Absolutely. And this thing has got a lot of names. So this is the marginal. And it's also called the evidence. So uh, it's the probability of the observations regardless of what the unobserved y variable would be. So it's the evidence of the observations on their own. Thank you. And I think I there was one more question, maybe. Yeah. May, may I ask, did I get it right? You say that it doesn't matter what is my prior belief probability. Uh, if I have the right likelihood, my answer would be something specific. I no, I, you didn't. I, uh, I'm, I'm, I don't think I said that, and, and it, it would be wrong. So your prior belief is extremely important. As you see, to some extent, prior and likelihood are exactly on the same footing. So if I change my prior, my posterior will change. For example, in, in this simple example, if my prior now I'll, I'll try to draw it uh, dashed so that it's not confused. If my prior was that the random variable x lies all to the right, then what the posterior, so alternative prior, let's say, then the posterior given this observation would also be shifted. to the right. Okay, so this observation was, in the previous case, quite close to the prior mean. So what would happen is that the mass, the, the mode of your distribution would be shifted a little bit with respect to the observation. Uh, in this case, if the prior is very much in disagreement with the, with the likelihood, then the posterior would be a compromise would be somewhere in between the prior and the likelihood. So the prior is absolutely important. Uh, professor? Yes? Can we plot the marginal probability in the graph, just like we do the rest of the parameters? Well, so the marginal probability, uh, this is a graph of X. And so here we're looking at probabilities of X. So the prior is probability of X. It's a marginal probability if you wish itself, but it's a prior. Uh, the marginal probability would be the probability of Y. So if I have Y equals five, regardless of what is um, X, I should plot it here. And it would be given by the integral of P of um, Y given X times p of x in dx. And so here, uh, with, with um, 
it would probably be something uh, rather broad as well, I guess. Oh, okay. Thank you. I have a question. Um, yep. Are we going to see in, the, in this course uh, how to choose the prior or any, even if we don't, if, if we don't see it, um, is there any way in which to know how, if the prior we choose is good or is, is wrong? Okay, so uh, th that's two questions. One is uh, related to this course and, uh, and the answer to the first question is really not really. Uh, so we're not going to look at how you choose the prior. Now, I could open a very, very big uh, discussion on how to choose priors. Yeah? Uh, I won't, but I'll tell you a little bit. Um, so there are essentially there are two schools of Bayesians. Yeah? There are the so-called uh, objective Bayesians and subjective Bayesians. So the subjective Bayesians insist that the prior is something that an expert should specify and should be informative. So if I were doing probabilistic modeling, as I do actually for a job, say in a, in a scientific context, for example, in applications to biology, I would choose the prior by either talking to a biologist or for example, if I was looking at, I don't know, structural data on proteins, I might use um, models of protein folding to obtain a prior distribution. If you're an objective Bayesian instead, you're looking at situations typically where you don't think there is good knowledge available. And there is a whole school amongst Bayesian statisticians on how to choose a prior that biases your posterior results as little as possible. So the objective Bayesians say, look, we, don't, we only want the data to speak. We don't want to impose our biases on the results. And so we want to select priors that confer, convey as little information as possible. And the problem is that, as should be clear from um, Bayes' theorem itself, there isn't such a universal uninformative prior. So depending on what the actual likelihood model is, an uninformative prior might be different, okay? And so a lot of research is for this class of models, this is an uninformative prior. That was the first part of the question. So this is all I'm going to tell you about how to choose your priors. In general, I'll assume that you have someone that can give you good information or you are an expert yourself. You, maybe you are a, a condensed matter physicist that writes down priors for protein folding. The second part of your question instead is, are there good ways to decide whether a prior was good? Now, I'm also not going to tell you much in this course, although I could tell you a little bit more. This falls into the so-called model selection set of questions. Yeah? So there are ways to assess whether one model gives a better fit to the data than another model. And there are also ways to do unconditional, let's say, to assess how good the fit of a model is to another model. So let's, let's do that now. So the key, comparing models. Okay, so you can always view in your Bayesian um, setup. So we are looking uh, at the probability of a certain variable, yi being equal to, uh, y being equal to a certain value, given that we've observed x being equal to xj. 
So that marginal probability that we were talking about is the key to decide whether a model is a good model, okay? So this is also called the evidence as well as the marginal likelihood. And it says essentially answers the question of what is the probability of observing Xi regardless of Y. So now if I have two different models, so two different, either because the prior is different or because the likelihood is different, or possibly because you know there are even different sets of random variables. This is the objective quantity that allows to tell me allows uh, allows me to say you know how probable is this data given the model. So if I now have given two models. M1 and M2, and prior probabilities over the models, P of M1, P of M2, because you may think that the model is more likely than the, more probable than the other a priori, then the base factor R is the probability of the observations and model, the, the observation and model one divided the probability of the observation and model two. Okay. Which is, of course, the same as the probability of the observation given that we're working in the framework of model one times the prior predict from model one divided by the probability of the observation given that we're working in the framework of model two. And so if this number is greater than one, that means that regardless of all the other variables that have marginalized, the data is more supportive of model one than of model two. So base factors are used for Bayesian decision-making. So I saw there was a question flashing up. So maybe we can have that question. I also saw in the, in the, in the chat that many of you were asking me about references and uh, I can give you a couple of references uh, at the end of this lesson, or maybe I can send them to Matteo and you can uh, circulate them by email. But let, let's have the question. Is it still there, the question? Uh, hi, sir. Uh, like, I also have a question. Yeah. Yeah, so like uh, you're saying the model models don't determine the priors, right? The priors are determined by the expert. Yes. And the model is like a likelihood model is the model, right? Or is it something else? Uh, no, say that again, I didn't get that. Uh, like you said uh, P of Xi given Yi in the last uh, slide. Uh, I mean, yeah. My, yeah, yeah. it is the likelihood model. Yes. And then- So that is what we think is the model, yeah. Yeah, and what is P of M1 then? P of M1 is how you compute P of Xi given Y, I mean, uh, M1 is how you compute P of Xi given Yi, right? No, M1 so M1, so now we are thinking that we have two models, yeah? So two models, a model means a connection of latent or of random variables and how they are related. 
Yeah? Of these random variables, x is observable. Okay, so in one model, we might have the, the temperature, we consider temperature and pressure, and they have a certain relationship. In another model, we may, I don't know, consider temperature, pressure, and volume, for example. So it's a, it's a richer model, but we always only observe temperatures. So in model one, we have a certain set of random variables and a certain set of relationships with the random variables, and we observe X. In model two, we have another set of random variables and another set of relationships, but we still observe X. So what we do, we compute the marginal distribution for X in the framework of model one, okay. and divide by the marginal distribution of X the observation. So this is a number, it's not, and it's not a distribution anymore. So because we put in the observation, it becomes a number. And so this becomes the ratio of two numbers. And then maybe we might have someone, an expert again, that tells us, look, it's the probability that you also need the volume is a third, while the probability that you don't need the volume is two thirds. So we put those numbers there. So there was another question appearing. Um, Also, the, there was a question in the chat asking whether there are any situations where the prior doesn't matter. So let me answer that question very briefly because this is a common situation that we will see. So what about when you have many observations? Yeah. So maybe you observe x equals to xi once, and then you re repeat the experiment. Let's say this is the first time you do the experiment, and you repeat the experiment, and you see the second time you get xj. This index counts the number of times, the, the, the number of the experiment. So if these experiments are independent, then effectively, in any case, you have a joint distribution over the probability of all the x1 to xn, if you've done experiments, n time, and the random variable. So suppose you're always doing the experiment in the same condition so that the variable y remains the same. OK. If the experiments are independent and identically distributed, then this becomes a product of n equals one to big N of P of X N given Y times P of Y. So now this is still my prior and this is my likelihood for all the observations. But now, as you can see, essentially, the more observations I do, the more likelihood I get. So the contribution of the observations to the posterior will eventually dwarf the contribution of the prior. So it is true to some extent that the prior becomes irrelevant in the limit for the number of observations becomes infinity. But even that is not precise, because if the prior says that one certain value of y has zero probability, then there is no amount of observations that will shift that prior. However, it is common to say that in the limit for very large numbers of observation, the prior becomes less important. So when you have lots and lots of observation, the prior becomes less relevant for your um, posterior computation and the likelihood becomes dominant. So I saw there was a question flashing. Please just unmute yourself because 
And I don't know how to do with Zoom to find, I mean, the chat flashes and then goes away. I have no idea how to. Excuse me, Professor. Yes, please. Uh, back then when you were talking about the bias factor, I mean, the odds ratio, yeah. uh, I have a question about that. Uh, could the odds ratio give us any intuition, I mean, any information about the limits of our um, variables that we choose in our modeling? I mean, for example, when you were talking about uh, having both uh, variables, pressure and temperature, uh, we for sure in our modeling, we could have some uh, limits on uh, each of these variables. Could the odds ratio give us any um, intuition about which, should, I mean, what we should choose for uh, the limits? Yeah, so, okay, so one way, may, maybe the, the base factor could be one way to do that. But another thing that one could do, and, and, and we're going to see it uh, later on towards the course, you could actually consider the limits of your variables as some additional parameters or some additional random variables. Yeah? And you could, if you wanted to be fully Bayesian, you could get a posteriori, what are the distributions over the lower bound and the upper bound, or what many people do, and it's convenient computationally to do, you could take the evidence and say, okay, this evidence depends on these additional parameters. And so I will find the parameters. So the lower possible, let's say, pressure and the higher possible pre highest possible pressure, I'll treat them as parameters that I optimize. So I'll optimize the marginal likelihood with respect to these parameters. Okay, thank you. And one more question, please. Yes, uh, please. Do we prefer to have uh, less variables in our modeling when we are using the, bio, the Bayesian theorem or not? It doesn't matter at all. Uh, in, in, I mean, okay, so there are several answers to this question. So the okay. purely theoretical answer is it does not matter. In fact, one of the, one of the great advantages of Bayesian models is that because you're doing this averaging, when you're comparing models, uh, you're not really at risk. So, so when you're doing, you see, when you compute the base factor, mm -hmm. so you have averaging out all the variables that you're not observing, okay? In model one okay. and in model two. And this averaging essentially automatically accounts because the probabilities are normalized, automatically accounts for model complexity. So it will not allow you to overfit in some sense. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously though, the, the, the other answer to your question is practical and, and working with lots and lots of variables might be computationally more complicated. So, and, and also it could be, let's say that from the point of view of understanding what you're doing might be more complex. Okay, so, thanks. To some extent, there is always a good case for having simple models. Thank you. No problem. So based, sorry. Yeah, please. Um, based, based on this base factor, if R is greater than one, then you are saying key model one is preferred over model two, or are you not making any such comments? Am I not making such? Yeah, yeah. So if R is greater than one, you would prefer model one compared to model two. I mean, uh, can you explain? I mean, I don't understand why you're saying that. Oh, because you see, what does this probability means? Look, it's better to look on the right side and then the left side. Yeah, this is a joint probability, but on the right side you have, okay, given the assumptions of model one, so the number of random variables, the prior distribution and the likelihood, what is the probability of the observations? On the denominator is, given the assumptions of model two, what is the probability of the observation? So the concept is that the observations should be somewhat typical. And so if they are more likely under model one, then model one is a better explanation for the observations. And that's why if R is greater than one, I will prefer model one. I would say, okay, model one is more supported by the data. Okay. Okay, thanks. No problem. And there were some more questions flashing. 
Were there more questions or was there, or was that it? Oh yeah, no, there are some questions. Oh, I don't, I, I, hmm. Just unmute yourself and, and, and speak is the easiest thing. So if not, let me just write a roadmap. for the course. So today we've kind of covered the, the, the basic concepts of probability. Now, what we're going to look at are some explicit cases of uh, probability distributions next time. And first of all, in one dimension, and then we will do probability distributions multivariate, so in multiple dimensions. Yes. I don't, uh, hmm. How do I find the chat? Uh, well, anyway. Once we Excuse have that, me, professor. Yes. Uh, if you uh, stop sharing your screen, you can yep. easily see the chat. Yeah, I know that, but I still want to write. So <laughs> maybe I can stop sharing and then I can uh, I can see. Yeah. So now I can see the chat. Yeah. So okay, Matteo was suggesting the David Mackay book. Yeah, another good book that I. Um, and it's freely available. Another good book that I recommend is um, Bayesian Reasoning and Machine Learning uh, by David Barber, which is also, uh, oh no, sorry, I didn't want to send it privately. Um, which is also freely available online. And uh, yeah, yeah, so, okay. So let, let's, uh, let's go back to the roadmap for the rest of the course. So we'll do probability distributions in one dimension and then we'll go on to multivariates. And these will be mainly well, it would be the Gaussian distribution, the multivariate Gaussian distribution, which is kind of the fundamental tool. Then we'll spend some time talking about linear models. And so these would be probabilistic PCA, which is a linear dimensionality reduction method. And then we'll talk about uh, Bayesian linear regression and basis function regression. And then finally, we'll move on to Gaussian processes. Um, all of these models are in some sense linear, which means that you can actually perform Bayesian inference analytically and, uh, and write down explicitly what the posterior distributions are. If we have more time towards the end, I will uh, explain briefly some methods to perform Bayesian inference when the models are intractable. And by intractable, I mean that you can't analytically compute the posterior. So the problem, which, you know, there's all sorts of problems in Bayesian inference. One of them, which we discussed quite a lot is, how do we choose the prior? But another good more problem is how do you choose the likelihood? The toughest problem computationally is now, how do you compute the evidence? And without the evidence, you don't get normalized probability distributions and you can't compute the posterior. 
So most of the difficulties in Bayesian statistics and machine learning research are compute efficiently this evidence because this evidence involves marginalizing out all the unobserved y variables. And if you have lots of variables or if they are continuous variables, you may have sums with lots of terms or high dimensional integrals, which are not feasible, not even with very strong computers. So I think that's it, I guess, um, uh, just over the one hour. And um, yeah. Professor, can I ask uh, regarding the material? So for instance, Professor Marsili will be providing say lecture notes and videos beforehand. Will that be the case with uh, your lectures? Will the notes and or videos be available some, for instance, maybe not the videos, but the notes, will they maybe be available somewhere beforehand? Um, well, I, I can discuss, so how, how does it work? I'll, I'll talk with Matteo about that uh, because I guess I, I could pre-record the, the lectures and then we could just have some questions during the lecture hour. Um, if if that worked, the the notes I've I've got stuff scribbled on my on you know on okay on, on okay. this uh, <laughs> okay. piece of paper, but uh, on this uh, notebook, but uh, I don't no, have them. May, on an maybe it'll be maybe it will be uh, say more useful. Maybe yes, more useful for the students to kind of have the notes in advance. Maybe even just to get acquainted with uh, what we'll be discussing about during the lectures to make them more uh, followable. But okay. I don't know, it's, uh, it's may not be, I don't know. Yeah, so I, yeah, so someone is saying that pre-recorded lecture won't be interactive. So yeah, I think I, I would prefer not to also. record the lecture, uh, but yes. I can try to uh, be specific with um, the type of, um, so giving you some concrete pointers to the books beforehand. Professor? Okay. Well, yep. Hi. Um, would you be providing us with a syllabus or a course outline detailing the entirety of probability and Bayesian discussions? Uh, yeah, yeah. I can I can write you a more detailed syllabus, but uh, you know, it would be like you know, a page of bullet points or something like that. All right. Thank you. Okay. So I think. Um, we can close today's session. So you will have uh, time in the forthcoming lectures to, to ask all questions. And uh, so I think uh, again, uh, Guido for- uh, Sorry, for, sir, uh, like, like, just a small question. Yeah. Yeah, uh, like, uh, sir, so like the base factor is a function of the outcome which you want to kind of study, right? No, the so the, the base factor is a function of the observations. Observation, sorry, not, yeah, yeah, observation, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so typically in the Bayesian world, you have some things that you can observe and some things that you can't observe. The idea is to use the observations to learn something mathematical about the distribution of what you can't observe. Okay. The base factor is, yeah, it's a function of the observations, but the observations are not something that can be changed. Okay. Sorry, yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yes. Any other question? So, okay. So yes, just not... one more, please, uh, Professor. Uh, yes. When, uh, when we say the probability of X given Y, uh, X and Y are, are two random variables, right? So Correct. that means yeah. these variables can be either independent variables or X could be the uh, X, uh, X could be dependent to Y. It means yeah. uh, in terms of Y is our observable, our independent variable, yeah. and X uh, depends on how we see the Y. So yeah. when when X is a dependent variable, and we don't know the formula, and we just we we just can observe Y. Yet we don't know the formula, so how can we find the evidence, which is p, uh, the probability of x? Exactly, that is why 
the course is called probabilistic modeling because you have to make models. So you may not know the formula, but what you generally will do is you will have a model of what X will be conditioned on Y. So all the models assume that there is dependency. If there are independent variables, then there's not much that can be said. It's just, you know, the prior, if, it is, if X is independent of Y, then there is nothing to be learned about Y from observing X. Thank you. Okay, so um, I think uh, we can uh, close our session here. Thank you again, uh, Guido, and uh, see you tomorrow at uh, 2 p.m. for uh, okay. the, uh, tomorrow's lectures. Excuse me, Professor Marsili. Yes. So you said that uh, you upload the pre-recorded lectures and we see them in advance or we just look at the material? Yes, I mean, the idea is that uh, you, you look them uh, 